Hey Wanderers, have you ever thought if it was possible to create small devices that are powered purely by the air we breathe? From the first battery, the voltaic pile, to hydroelectric power, to wind turbines, to burning of coal and oil, all the way to utilizing the sun's energy through solar panels. We as humans have relied on all of these sources to power our lives with our electronic devices, from air conditioning, to smartphones, all the way to even international space stations. However, many of these sources are damaging to the environment or aren't always the best options due to factors out of control. For one, burning coal produces large masses of greenhouse gases. One kilogram of coal when burnt can produce about 2.86 kilograms of carbon dioxide. Hydroelectric power utilizes water and can disrupt the migration of fish. Solar panels aren't always the best options as we cannot control how the weather acts. So, is there a more effective, safe, and efficient method of generating electricity? Bacteria such as Mycobacterium spegmatis are able to use traces of hydrogen in the air as a source of energy. This isn't all too surprising considering some bacteria can survive in the most harsh of environments from the Antarctic soil to volcanic craters and even the deep sea. What we didn't know is how such a small microorganism is able to utilize hydrogen as a source of energy. Until now, thanks to the work of Dr. Riz Grinter and PhD candidate Ashley Kropp from Monash University, who were able to discover the exact mechanism Microbacterium spagmatis uses to be able to utilize hydrogen as a source of energy. This bacteria is said to have a bacillus shape or rod-like shape. In the entire bacterial cell, an enzyme or biological machine called Huck is able to use hydrogen from the air and use it as a source of energy through a process called oxidation, which is the same electrochemical principle applied in hydrogen fuel cells. Oxidation is a process where the electrons from a molecule, in this case hydrogen, is being removed. But what remained a mystery was whether Huck could oxidize hydrogen on its own or whether it is coupled to another process required to produce energy. Dr. Grinter and Ms. Kropp test the ability of pure Huck to oxidize hydrogen from the atmospheric air. And what they found was quite interesting. Huck was able to oxidize hydrogen below the detection limits without having oxygen interfering with the process. And this is important to know because until now, we thought that the enzymes that could oxidize hydrogen from the atmosphere would not function when there is high concentration of oxygen around as oxygen would interfere with the process. So the fact that Huck is able to oxidize hydrogen without oxygen interfering and it's able to function at oxidizing ox hydrogen when there is a very low concentration of it means that Huck is extremely efficient at oxidizing hydrogen. What is also interesting is that when we provide Huck with more hydrogen, it functions at an even greater level, generating an greater electrical output. So what makes Huck different from all the other enzymes that are able to oxidize hydrogen. According to Ms. Kropp and Dr. Grinter, the gas channels that provide hydrogen access to the active site is very narrow. And with the use of a very cutting edge technique called all atom molecular dynamics simulations. What the simulations uncovered was that Hux basically excludes oxygen from the active site by series of bottlenecks. And they confirmed this by testing a mutated version of Huck where the bottlenecks were deleted. And to no surprise, oxygen reached the active site of Huck. Further series of experiments allowed the scientists to unfold the exact biochemical reactions that Huck uses to be able to consume hydrogen and use it as energy. It seems that Huck takes the hydrogen from the air, oxidizes it and takes the electrons and donates it to menaquinone. So then that menaquinone becomes menaquinol, both of which are just different forms of vitamin K2. Another astonishing finding is that even when Huck is put into extreme conditions, when it's frozen or even heated up to 80 degrees Celsius, it still functions fine. Which explains why this Mycobacterium spegmatis could survive in intense, harsh environments like volcanic craters. So. Is there a significance that this finding could play in how us humans will live our lives? Scientists and engineers could work together to figure out how we could incorporate this enzyme Huck into electrodes, which could then be used to create small 
air-powered devices as an alternative to solar-powered devices. What would be interesting to see is to test whether Huck could function properly in a zero-gravity environment to determine whether it is a viable option to make small air-powered devices that can be used in the International Space Station.